So welcome to the first What Makes a Difference podcast. We just rebranded from the Rethinking Trauma and Transition podcast. And today we have our very special guest is Dr. Dan Roberts. And he's serving in the US forces due to retire soon. And could you give us an introduction about yourself, please, Dan? Sure. Uh, Dr. Dana Roberts, I'm the president and CEO of Moral Injury Support Network for Service Women Incorporated. That's a nonprofit organization based in uh, North Carolina. And uh, what we do is we conduct research, we do training and education, and provide direct support to service women. Our, our research and training is, is not just to service women, but it's to psychologists, social workers, chaplains, whoever's involved in supporting uh, veterans. And it's about moral injury. So we are our project we're connecting right now looks at moral injury in military spouses. We've completed a research project on moral in- injury in women veterans. So other other research projects that we're supporting, and then we take that information, we, we put together training for military leaders or for retreat leaders or for practitioners, whatever. So that's that's my the main focus as I end retirement. For the last 32 years, I've been involved in the U.S. Army and over 20 years of those in the U.S. Army Chaplain Corps. So that's where my, my passion to help people comes from that 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 part of my experience but yeah getting ready to retire from the army soon and just focus on uh my nonprofit work full-time thanks That's for having me distinguished career Dan. thank you it's also a thank you from rich and i because you're so generous with your information Absolutely. and with your knowledge and it's very much appreciated so we first started having conversations with you because we were i suppose very conscious that the level of awareness, research and acknowledgement for moral injury in the UK is much, much lower than you have within, for instance, Canada, the USA, etc. And we reached out to you to say, can we have a chat? And I'm just thinking that for probably quite a few people, it might be the first time they've heard that term, moral injury. Right. And I'm wondering if you would to, I suppose, give us a bit of an explanation in terms of what moral injury actually is? Sure. So moral injury is a uh, ancient human problem, <laughs> but it's only recently in the last maybe two decades or so become a research phenomenon. But moral injury, that term refers to when someone experiences a traumatic event, that like violates their deeply held sense of what is right or wrong that can that can be injurious to them to the point that they lose some functionality a sense of a loss of self-esteem loss of um even identity um they can experience some real spiritual crises usually accompanies guilt and shame those kind of things. So uh, it's closely related to PTSD and many folks that have PTSD is actually a result of a moral injury. But some examples, moral injuries, examples, and they can happen. It's not just a veteran phenomenon. It can, I mean, it can happen to a human being in any kind of setting. But from a veteran standpoint, let's say, you know, it could be for women, sexual assault is often a moral injurious experience, hazing, uh, the extreme disrespect they might experience in, in the military. But it also could be due to combat, and, and men face that too, and men face sexual assault too. So I don't want to totally, you know, it, I'm just giving you some examples. But some of the stuff that, that I've talked to some military veterans it wasn't just one combat experience necessarily, but just months and months of grueling combat, and it just eventually begins to get to you. It could be war atrocities you experience or see in the medical field. You know, they're look what used to be called burnout is now being sort of re re-imaged or rebranded as moral injury because they're beginning to see it's not just about doctors working too hard or nurses or whatever but the lack of resources the uh 
decisions made in the U.S. It's an insurance driven decisions. But if you have like uh, one bill payer like in Canada, I believe you might have that in the U.K., right? It could be government decisions about who gets care and who doesn't, those mm-hmm. kind of things. A lot of folks during the COVID, you know, where medical personnel were forced to work in an environment with lacking the proper uh, protection equipment, those, those kind of things. So there's a lot of examples that can happen. Um, one one example I like to use that could apply to anyone, for instance, is, you know, if you get in a horrific car accident that, that was just a result of a mistake or something, that might, you might experience PTSD from it, but not necessarily moral injury. But if the person who hit you was a drunk driver, and then that could result of, that could result in moral injury just because the the moral violation that happened beyond just an accident or somebody making a mistake or bad weather or whatever, this is a person who knowingly got in a vehicle when they shouldn't have and knew they shouldn't have, and that resulted in a tragic death or something. And then often in those cases, the drunk driver does doesn't even get hurt that much. So, so like that's a an example of something that could happen to anyone. We tend to think of moral injury as a veteran phenomenon, but it's really it's a human problem. Well, I'm wondering, Dan, for people who are listening and watching, is why would a minister be interested in, or how can a minister help with? working with people with moral injury and why would the minister be involved in that sort of arena? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, moral moral injury is a spiritual, is both a spiritual and psychological problem, right? So from a spiritual point of view, you know, whenever you're talking about morals, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're talking about religion per se, because even an atheist has morals, Right. They have a they have they have a sense of right and wrong. So 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 it's not necessarily a religious thing, although religion can, you know, um so some sense of moral value comes from religion, or people that are religious, that's often where they get their moral value. Um, but when when we look at moral injury, it often these kind of questions about God and uh, uh, where is he in all this or how did he let this happen or what, what, you know, those kind of existential questions ministers can really help with. But then beyond that, ministers can also really help with who am I now? You know, what, where do I go from here? What do I uh, how do I get forgiveness for either what I've done or what I've seen or what I've experienced? Um, how do I, you know, cause forgiveness is a huge part, either forgiving someone that done something to you or forgiving yourself. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. And it doesn't mean that, that you trust that person again or anything like that, but it, it just merely means I, I want to be able to let go of this um so that i can so i can move on you know and so so ministers can do a lot to help with those sort of issues regardless of where a person's religion is a good a good minister can listen to the person and help help them lead from their own perspective so yeah so ministers are are uh play a key role well in as I mentioned before, all the different uh, ways that people people feel harmed, either loss of identity, self-image, those kind of things. Good ministers can become a mirror or, or can be someone that can just help them rethink through and think through, uh, talk through how they're feeling, how they might re- Get help help them think through options or different ways of thinking about what happened to them, how it affected them, how they need to move forward. So reframing and those kind of things. So, you know, of course, counselors, psychologists, other people can do that. 
but ministers bring this spiritual perspective that not everybody feels comfortable with. And so, so when you're talking moral injury, you really talk an interdisciplinary approaches, you know, it takes a, a number of different, uh, depending on the person, it can take a number of different modalities to help someone uh, recover from a moral injury. Do you think, Dan, that that's part of the challenge with moral injury? Because I know we've had quite a few conversations with you where we've kind of debated, I suppose, the structure of moral injury. And while it's not in the DSM-5, I actually don't think it belongs in there. Yeah. Because it is so complex and there's almost different flavours to moral injury. And there can be elements of betrayal, elements of that sanctuary trauma where you've gone for support, haven't got it. There can be that sense of, I suppose, the breaching of the psychological contract that you hold with other people, whether that's employment or friendships or other forms of relationships where you, either through your own actions or theirs, are placed in a situation where that's that's broken. Um, It can be actions that you have no choice in making, but still feel conflicted in. But it's the right choice and the right action at that time and place, but it still places you in conflict. Or it can be conflict in your expectations of others that have not been met. So it's such a complex thing because it can be organisational or very specific. And thinking about where I'm coming from on that is is that maybe one of the reasons why so long people have almost shied away from acknowledging it because it is so complex. It's not a simple beast, moral injury. Yeah, you, you said a lot there. Um, and and all that you said, uh, it's true. By the way, Brett Litz, who is a um, one of the key researchers in moral injuries, has done a ton of work. He would agree with you, even as uh, who, who and he is a psychologist. He would agree with you. It doesn't belong to DSM five for many of the reasons you mentioned. It's so complex. There's lots and lots more research we need to do. And when you put something in the DSM five, you buy. By you know, by nefid- by requirement, you're going to boil it down to specific things, objective things that that you know a psychologist can ask about or determine, and we're nowhere near getting to something like that. But I do think you know, to your point, because of the complexity of it, and depending on your approach, it, it can be very difficult. So, looking at various different. Um, industries, if you will, or professions, I guess would be a better word. So psychologists in general tend to like things very, very, you know, objectified in a way, like, you know, specific, like, if you look at PTSD, there are very specific things that qualify, you know, there's criteria, six, seven criteria, whatever it is. And each criterion has very specific things even if it's a little subjective it still has very specific things you have to make and psychologists that's that field right it tends to really try to think in terms of even though even though it's dealing with subjective things and individual people it it tries to to really be very specific about what a thing is and when it occurs and so on and so forth now i'm not a psychologist and and i'm not being critical i'm just saying that's kind of how that for me in the chaplaincy field it's very helpful to not be specific right it's very helpful to to just understand if a person feels this deeply held violation and i can help them put a name to it moral injury um now they feel okay now i know what this like i know what this is putting a name to it can make some sense and then we can work with where do we go from here and just how are you thinking about it? We we can help work through all those things. It doesn't make that much of a difference to me whether whether it is would it meet the exact definition of moral injury, which we haven't all agreed to what that is anyway, or 
if this person now feels like they have they have put a name to it, something they can work on, something I can help them with. When you're talking about funding and dollars and insurance or whatever, right, then again, you need very specific things to be able to say, well, this can get you disability or this can get you care because it's covered by insurance or some. So there's there's certain groups or areas that want to boil it down to something specific so that that avenue can be taken. But there are others that uh, I'm fine with complexity, right? Because it, you know, so so I do think that that as you mentioned, the complexity of it really makes it difficult to um, for groups of people to to work on it from the from a from a from a standpoint of a survivor, right? I just need help. Um, and I'm not really, you know, if getting it covered by insurance and stuff like that is also any care or therapy is also very important, you know, but from a practitioner, I'm going to tend to look at it through my own lens. So, so I don't know where we go in, in terms of, of this phenomenon, um, and where we go as a as a society in determining what it is and how do we help people um, because there are so many questions to be to be answered. I think people are embracing it more and more, but um, when you start wading into it more deeply, you, it easy it is easy to come up with a sense of like wow uh, this is so big I don't know where to start um did that make any sense or did I just it uh, does, yeah, it this does. Place? um <clears throat> so the way I'm looking at Dan is the psychiatrist psychologist they're gonna work with a defined problem say anxiety depression post-traumatic right. stress Right, and that's just that defined thing. Whereas you're going to look at the whole system, the whole person, and start right. picking, unraveling those right. bits and pieces. Right. Yeah, but that's that a good way to say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's why it's important to work together. That's why yeah. we need an interdisciplinary approach mm-hmm. because we all bring a different, you know, and non nonprofit organizations and. Or groups doing like retreats and those kind of things, they're they're doing some phenomenal stuff, and it's it's not clinical, you know, um, it's just you know these amazing therapy kind of things um, that that maybe they started with with PTSD as a problem set, but you can easily you know, and and some retreat leaders don't know about moral injury, some do, but you can. You know, a lot of those same modalities can work for moral injury. You just need to help people understand, you know, where their where their symptoms are coming from, and it's because of moral injury, not because of maybe what they what they maybe have been told in the past. So, mm-hmm. so you don't necessarily even need a clinical approach because there's a lot of amazing work that's being done in that way too. I think there's also. Um quite a lot of misdiagnosis of somebody having post-traumatic stress rather than the diagnosis of more injury. But then that person, for insurance purposes, may need that diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. Yeah, I think that's true. In fact, early on when I started learning about moral injury, uh, one of the first persons I ran into uh, was this master sergeant uh, who was – he had seen a lot of combat uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he had been diagnosed with PTSD, um, and he was taking medicine and all kinds of things, and it wasn't really helping him that much. And then a chaplain introduced him to the idea of moral injury, and it made all the difference in the world. Um, and he was able to 
to then, you know, this this particular minister was a Baptist minister, and he took him through uh, the idea of salvation and and that kind of thing. And so, so that really, really helped him. And what he needed most was forgiveness. And what he and his uh, fellow rangers did, they did a lot of close in combat, right? A lot of house to house fighting, and and. In a lot of those scenarios, they were told, like, hey, everybody, everybody in the building is a bad guy. You know, it's a, it's a free, free targets. And so they would go in to buildings, uh, throwing a lot of explosives and and just use a lot of violent, you know, tactics. And then when everything was cleared, they would find women and children and those kind of things. And, and so it was bad intelligence, right? Or or commanders that didn't care whatever it was but but they then they were they were the ones that had had you know taken those lives and so you know they tended to self self you know assist themselves by by through a lot of alcohol and drugs and other kinds of activities but but deeply inside you know what they were what they were really dealing with was the guilt and shame um, and that's what what led to their PTSD type symptoms. Um, but it was really what he was really dealing with was the guilt of of taking innocent lives uh, over and over and being forced to do it. Um, and and at the time when you're when you're doing it right, you're just you're you're doing warrior stuff, and you don't have time to think about it. But over eventually, you know, you are going to have those those moments in the middle of the night where that's all you can think of. And, and that's what he was dealing with. So being able to, so all the PTSD stuff wasn't really helping him, but when he could get to the idea of that God has forgiven him because of the work that Jesus did on the cross from that Christian perspective, he would, it, it completely changed his life. So. Do you think some of that, I suppose when I'm, it strikes me that there's almost a directional element to moral injury because if I was to boil it down to really short description, it's almost that sense of moral outrage. And I think outrage is a really good word to describe it. It's that sense of it's so wrong, I can't find a place to put this in terms of my values and my beliefs. But I sometimes I see a difference when I'm working with people in terms of where that that outrage is directed, whether it's directed externally at something or someone that's placed that person in that situation, or whether it's extent it's reflected internally at themselves for their own choices and actions they've been forced to make, and sometimes it's both. And as you say, it's almost like you've got to work your way through the layers. To resolve each right. layer to get it, but but that directional element struck me because sometimes if it's only external in some ways, that's almost and, I, and I'm really really hesitating to say easier because I don't want to because moral injury is never easy, right? But it's but the, when it's when you've got both directions at the same time, it almost adds that layer in terms of the intensity and the impact on that sense of who that individual is after that experience? Yeah, I, I think it's very true. Um, you know, so the directional piece you mentioned, I think, is is really critical in the sense there are often, and with a, in a lot of cases, there are two, two directions, if you will, like you mentioned, externally and internally, that that the blame or the guilt, the shame, the the rage can be directed. Uh, by way of example, I, I talked to a, a Canadian pilot, helicopter pilot. I believe they were in Africa. And there was a horrific accident that happened, flight accident, and um, that he wasn't involved with. But he could, it was at night, he could hear the, the, the you know, the, the request for help and support through the radio and they had the emergency beacon and why, you know, I, all the details, you know, I'm not a pilot or anything, but, 
but the long story short is that that they were they knew that the soldiers and and the crew were dying like it was a horrific accident and so what they wanted to do is go out and rescue them but the commander made the decision that no flying would happen at night because the risk of uh you know another accident didn't want to lose more more people trying to rescue so they knew the folks were dying and they had to wait all night just just really completely you know very angry very you know because they they really wanted to go out and help their people and so by the time they were able to fly when daylight had came if i remember the story right everyone died uh everyone had died or most had i i want to say everyone but the, the bottom line is right there they had this particular pilot had tons of guilt and shame for for what happened and it was in two directions one he was very angry at the commander for not letting them fly even though he understood in some way the reasoning for it right that you know i lose these people i could lose even more trying to rescue but for him he would have made the decision let's go get him you know um and so 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 he's very angry and he had a lot of angst about that but then he had a lot of internal guilt too that was really eating him alive because i should have done something and maybe i should have flown anyway right i should have a uh, hundred should haves and then the shame of just what happened that while he was there his fellow soldiers um uh, pilots lost their lives and he was able to do nothing about it so so there's both an external direction for the rage but then there's this internal guilt and shame and i find that that's true in a lot of cases if you look at sexual assault cases many times the person the survivor who um really could have been completely powerless to do anything about it they often still feel this guilt over i should have this i should have done that i should have known better i shouldn't have been at that place i shouldn't have drank whatever but this external rage at um at the perpetrator and i and i so so when you're dealing with moral injury in that directional piece you're talking about there's often multiple directions for for who this rage and and blame could be aimed at it could even be higher going back to the to the pilot situation why were we there in the first place what good did we what good did we do you know our people lost their lives for anything you look at the us pull out of afghanistan and how many veterans now are feeling like well that's great we wasted 20 years and lots of my i lost a bunch of friends for what um, so, so it really, that's part of the trick with moral injury is that, as you mentioned earlier, the complexities, the multi-directions, like this is no easy, you know, no easy thing. I think it can be a trigger for so many other experiences as well. And, and the example you've just given is a classic example. And I hear that a lot with other similar experiences where, the actual point of moral injury also is represented by a, by a sense of the devaluing of service. It's almost mm. as if you've cast aside the gift I gave you in my service by your mm. actions now. Right. And it doesn't have to be at the point of service. It can be beyond that. You That could be a service lever that, that now feels that moral injury for the service and the gift of the time that they've given and then seen the subsequent decisions made that have undervalued that choice. You right. Know, so, yeah, it's, I think it's almost time scale isn't necessarily, or is more complex, maybe, in terms of how moral injury impacts, because it can often be decades after the actual event that almost it's linked to, but the linkage itself is very different from you could say, I suppose, your traditional view of trauma. Right, right, and and, and we tend we tend to think of moral injury, or people tend to think of moral injury often as 
or at least early on in the construct of the phenomenon as like a specific trauma, specific thing. But we're finding in our own research, too, it's often um, a building up of event after event after event after event, you know, long deployments, with lots of stuff happening, like in each individual thing didn't necessarily result, but over time, you, you just get so worn down and so tired of doing the killing and doing the bombing and doing the whatever. And from a family point of view, you know, the spouse, just the constant deployments, the constant moving, the constant destabilization, like that can all lead to those kind of, you know, the same kind of symptoms that we see in like a specific point trauma. Um, and it's just like the human spirit just gets worn down kind of, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing to your point is it can be, you know, I've talked to, I talked to in our research with women veterans, like one of the women, she retired a Sergeant major um, and it wasn't until after she retired and had some time to think about it, she had a lot of guilt over, you know, here I was a, a woman, I was a sergeant major, it was a very high rank. And yet, during all my time in service, how did I help the women who were being assaulted or harassed or whatever? I should have been able to do more. And I don't think I did anything, you know. Um, and so, you know, while she was in the service, she was doing the best she could. Um, and and I, as a sergeant major myself, you know, people that are not sergeants majors tend to think, when I'm a sergeant major, I'm going to fix everything, or sergeant majors can. And it's really like I don't have that much of more authority than anybody else have. I have bosses, I have a certain realm of influence, but I can't change everything I want to change. You know, I can only do what I can do, and so. So part of what my job as a minister is, is, is just trying to let people off the hook, you know, trying to let people understand, help them understand, Hey, you did the best you could at, at, at the time, you know, um, if you would have known what you know, now you probably wouldn't have taken those actions. You know, um, you may not have blown up that building. You may not have, you know, whatever. Um, but you didn't. And so, so that gets to that forgiveness part, you know, of being able to say, Hey, I'm not, I'm not a uh, horrible person that has no hope of, of, of being, you know, I'm a person that made a certain set of decisions given the circumstances I had. And now I feel terrible about them, but you know, I did what I did knowing what I did, did. And now how do I, you know, like work through that so I can not spend the rest of my life uh, living on those past moments. Yeah. As you touched on um, sex assault. Mm -hmm. and, and this is getting a bit like Ali was saying, there's not the right context or the right, there's one for better words really is what makes military sexual trauma worse for want of a better word than civilian sexual trauma yeah it's a great question and i think i know what you're getting to and i think a big part of it is just the narr the military narrative which is around we have your back we have each other we take care of each other we are you know in the civilian world you don't necessarily expect uh, you know, there's in the military, there's a sense of we're willing to sacrifice our lives for each other. Right. And if you're in my squad, you're uh, I will defend, defend you. I'm your battle buddy. I'm your whatever. Right. To the very end. And and, you know, if you work at IBM, right, that's probably not the the company culture is, is sacrificing our lives for each other. Right. That's not, but in the military, that that's the culture. And so when one of your own, like to me, I think 
for a lot of women expect that's that's the deepest hurt is that it was one of my own one of the people that was supposed to have my back that was supposed to be willing to sacrifice their lives for it that's why i joined this honorable organization i wanted my life to mean something very important i wanted to serve and sacrifice for others and then when that happens like it it just it 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 it, is because the moral violation is so deep um because of the narrative built around it and and to to illustrate that point and what i talked to a woman who was who served in vietnam during the vietnam era and she said well i'm not sure if i was morally injured or not and i said okay tell me about it and she said well yeah I, she said i was i was raped um while i was in the military but I mean, what do you expect? It was a good old boys club back then. Um, and and so her sense of violation was like, she said, she said, yeah, it was wrong. But, you know, I don't know if I'd call it moral injury. So, I mean, there's a whole lot to that statement. But this, the simple thing I want to illustrate is that the expectation was that that could happen because the military at the time was a good old boys club. Um, and the, the, the narrative around the military has changed so much uh, where it is like the militaries have spent the last decade really building up this idea of, of togetherness, self-sacrifice, all this stuff. That, that people join the military with no expectation at all that their greatest harm might come from those they serve with, you know, and so... That's, I think, the difference mm -hmm. between a military and a civilian scenario. And what I'd say, add on to that as well, is that you're potentially working with that individual day in, day out as well. And there's that constant of being with that person who may have violated that space or, or yourself, and you're seeing them and that as that violation. Right. I think there's also an element almost sometimes, and I know that's certainly something that I see in terms of the information in the UK is almost that institutional betrayal and how that's then dealt with or acknowledged or not acknowledged. And I think there's a huge issue with the levels of disclosure there when and that, that goes across all genders. And there's almost a, a huge issue in terms of recognition of what is that sexual assault. And there's a normalising sometimes of those experiences. And I wonder if there's a wave of moral injury coming as those disclosures and those realisations hit. And those points where the normalization of it falls away to say, no, this is wrong regardless. It's almost like that delayed impact of that when you have that moment of recognition that this is something that places my values at a point of betrayal, at a point of being not met, of being breached. Yeah, I... <clears throat> I agree with that. And I think that uh, I think related to that, I think there are a lot of leaders that are suffering from. And maybe they don't think about it every day while they're working because you tend to, you know, but uh, I remember talking to a woman that I was mentioning to her, I'm retiring soon. And she said, Wait till she said, <laughs> wait till the day after you re retire, then it all hits you. And, and she was, she was as a civilian working in the sharp office, sexual harassment, assault and prevention and all that. And, and we were, we were talking about that issue and what she was referring to was, you know, all the decisions she should have made and make so on and so forth. And I think there are a lot of leaders, senior leaders that are are 
going to face some of that in that just like that sergeant major of what should i have done i knew it was happening but i you know did i do everything i could do and i think when you're when you're a senior leader and you're looking at things you're looking at a lot of numbers and trends not necessarily individuals and humans as you step away from that and you have time to think about the the individuals that that maybe were harmed and you decided there wasn't enough evidence to go forward or you decided whatever decisions you made and feeling like did i really take care of people that i swore an oath to take care of i think there is a lot of that waiting for people when they have time for it you know i did you know i did speak to a two-star general recently and uh, i won't tell you where he works or anything but i i asked that question does he think because he in his talk he talked about he 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 actually let the audience in just a just a little bit about some of the struggles he's had you know and and he mentioned that he had health issues, financial issues, relationship struggles, all that. And we tend to think of senior leaders as like, they must, like they don't have problems, right? I mean, two-star general is making all this money, you know, what problems could he have? I, I have problems. But you come to realize like they all have problems because they're humans. And so after his talk, I was able to get a couple minutes with them. And I, I thanked him for for being transparent. And I asked him, I said, I think there are a lot of senior leaders walking around with a lot of guilt and shame for the things that are happening. Cause they have to get in front of us. They have to get in front of the troops and, and encourage resiliency and get your finances, right. Take care of your family, all that stuff. Meanwhile, they've got some aspect of their life. That's, you know, on fire right <laughs> but they don't want anybody to know about it because you know what would people think of them so i asked him i said i think there are a lot of senior leaders with guilt and shame related to those kind of things and what do you think and he said that's absolutely right and i and so so when you see these you know generals and sergeants major whatever and they're in the public eye or and they're in front of the soldiers and they're saying all the right things you know, we know that in their life, they probably have a lot of decisions they've made that they're, um, and, and maybe, as you mentioned much earlier on, they, there were no other decisions to make, but it was still, somebody was being harmed by that decision, but they, it's like the choice between bad and bad, which is not as bad. And I think they're walking around with a lot of that. Um it's you the know, classic and, double and, bind, isn't it? No matter yeah, which way you right. turn, you're going to place yourself in a point of injury, a point of of moral ambiguity, of moral outrage at the choices that in the situation you have no choice but to make or choose between. And it is the classic double bind. Yep, absolutely. And, and really in leadership training, nobody talks about those decisions no. In the Sergeant Major Academy, we talked about gray areas, but it was like, what are you, what are you talking about, right? It's just, but nobody ever really talks about. You're going to be forced to make a decision that you're going to hate, no matter what decision you make. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, and it's true. You know, there, there are decisions I have made that I was like. Uh, I, I had to make it, but I, not, it, you know, I wasn't happy with it, but there was no other decision, right? It was just something you have to live with. And, and we tend to think of moral injury as being about the survivors, but, you know, now I'm, uh, now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm also pretty empathetic for leaders who have to make those decisions and who's talking to them about that, you know? Yeah. Well, as I say, it's lonely the top. 
Um, yeah, exactly. So a little while ago, I was speaking to um, the chap who used to be in the RAF, and he's running a leadership course for senior RAF officers. Um, part of the course was to go up on an angled, greasy pole and have to get obviously get to the other end and carry on the course. And everybody, pretty much everybody was slipping off. And as he was chatting to this officer, the senior officer, he was saying is, you must have it pretty easy up, up there. And he goes, no, he said that this pole is pretty much an analogy for what it's like. Um, because he was saying is you've got to compete with all those senior officers around you who've got big egos and all that anyway. Plus, because he's working at cabinet level, you've got to deal with all those. And every time you're making a mistake, you're falling off that pole and you've got to start again to reestablish yourself. Yeah, I think yeah that's, that's, uh, that's, I like that illustration. Yeah. I think that's sometimes also about recognizing that that the moral injury ripples it does have ripples it's not limited to one individual but where that one individual experiences that injury there there is likely ripples throughout those levels with those people that are potentially making those difficult decisions and living with the repercussions knowing that they're maybe being forced to put people at risk knowing that these are the potential outcomes knowing that there is nothing else that they can right. do in those situations knowing what the fallout of that is going to be right absolutely so in terms of that then i know certainly you can't go back in time and a lot of people, when they experience these things, will will use the phrase, I just want to be the person I was before. And it's funny, as we were talking, and you were, you were talking about forgiveness, Dan, mm -hmm. what also occurred to me was that in some ways it's about a reconciliation of these different elements of yourself as well. Right. That it's finding a way to fit them back together in a new shape because you can't go back. You now right. have knowledge and experiences that you didn't have at that point when you were that person you want to be again. Right. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't rebuild those parts. Right. No, it's true. I think it's important to remind people that that one incident, that one thing, the thing you're struggling with, whatever it is, that's not all of who you are. Right. So there's, you know, a person might have a sense of like, I'm such a bad person now, but I can't, you know, God can never forgive me or I'm just trash now, whatever. But if you can help see, well, wait a minute, or, you know, let's look at other aspects of your life. And so for a lot of, a lot of areas, the person is a good person, right? They're doing good things. They're doing their best to take care of their soldiers. They're, doing their best to be a good husband, father, whatever. They pay their bills, whatever it is, right? And so so you have one piece here that you're really struggling with, but that's not all of who you are. And so we want to help, you know, help the person, try to help the person see themselves not just through the light of the of of their trauma, but holistically. And then to your point, like, let's work on that. Let's work on that one piece. But in the meanwhile, let's find lots of other things to be thankful for, to be joyous about. Like we, we need to, with people, and this is something I work on myself too, is just uh, what can, what can help you is joy and thankfulness. And so how, you know, what are things we can be thankful for? What are things we can be joyous about and beginning to like, um, get the person to to spend a lot of time doing that, and that can help repair that other part. It gives you the energy and the optimism to then be able to look at that other area in a in a positive enough way that we can find forgiveness. That we can then say, okay, what did we learn from this? How can we use that? And and for a lot of people, things like advocacy or um helping others is 
is the most important way that they can help or the biggest way they can help is how can you take your experience and now use this to help others and when you're helping other people there's no other there's no nothing else that can do more to help repair yourself than by helping other people and of course getting therapy and all that for yourself it helps you it, it's like a they feed on each other. So helping others helps you, but then you also need to get help so that you can, you can be in a condition to help others and so on and so forth. So they work together, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's not about whatever happened, happened, whatever, whatever. And so, you know, there's some good that we can find uh, that can come out of this. Um, there's often, you know, I, I was talking to a spouse who just, her husband had PTSD and he was really, really disabled. And so she went from prior to, to his PTSD, she went from, you know, a, a sort of a dream life for her of being a spouse, being very involved in church doing church activities, you know, he handled finances stuff. He handled a lot of, you know, taking care of things around the house, all that stuff. Right. And so, and so she was just happy being a, a wife and a mother and doing the church stuff and whatever. And and now she does everything. She has to pay the bills. She has to, she has, she doesn't have time for church activities like she used to. She has to take care of the kids. She has to work a job because, he can't work and all this stuff. And, and it just felt like this enormous pressure upon her. But as she explained all that, and then she said, but you know, I wasn't very strong before. And she said, now I'm a much stronger person. She said, in my job, I'm an account executive or something, whatever it was. But she said, I'm in charge of accounts, customer accounts that are worth millions of dollars. I could have never imagined myself doing that before. So although I'm under tremendous stress and pressure, the good thing is I'm much stronger as a person now. And, and I, I know that I can, I can really do anything because I do so much. And so that's an example where she would have never asked for those experiences. She didn't never want, it's not what she wanted in her life. And she was still struggling with the idea of God and where is he at and all this stuff. But she's able to look at herself now and know I'm a much stronger, more capable person than I ever would have been before. And that is a good thing. You know, I found tremendous respect for her. But that goes to the, that there is something good we can find in this. There is something good we can make of this. Uh, let's look for that, you know. I suppose that comes back to that reconciliation piece again, doesn't it? And also what that, there's almost like a resetting of boundaries that happens in that recovery from that moral injury. And what happens at the end of that process, well, if it ever ends, it's always continuing a, a continuing journey. But I tend, what I tend to see is people coming out with much more clearly defined boundaries and much more clearly defined behaviours in relation to how they establish and maintain those boundaries so that they are almost like taking back control of that perimeter and saying, no, this is mine now, and you don't dictate what crosses that I do. And that sounds like part of parcel of that, of that almost growth process as a result of that adversity of that experience. And as you're yeah, talking earlier, Dan, about yeah. joy and all that is goes along with gratitude as well, I think. So there's um a friend of friend of ours who's on a previous podcast, and he helps someone just by saying over a five-day period. Find something you like about yourself on day one. Day two, find two things you like about yourself. Day three, three things. Day four, four things. Day five, five things. And that chap who we had phoned up, our friend, never had to go back to him again because he had found out, oh, okay, I am grateful for things. I have yeah. got these things that I like about myself and other stuff as well. 
Yeah, that's that's great. And you know, the the two star general I was talking to, too, uh, one of the things he shared was that that he himself, you know, does daily affirmations, and that was a huge thing he had to learn because as he started experiencing these problems, right, then he started to lose his sense of value because as a military leader, I'm, you know, you you feel like you have to be physically fit. You have to be smart. You have to, you have to be all these things, right? You can't have flaws and, and that's nonsense, but that's just sort of like how you begin to, to build yourself up the, 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 the narratives around it. And so, so he, as he experienced these problems, he realized like his, and for a lot of people, their own self-image really is garbage. I mean, they, they really do. If they're really being honest with themselves, they spend a lot more time thinking about what they're not rather than what they are. And I'm as guilty as anybody of just being super hard on myself. And so he had to learn and he did a recording of himself. And and he listens to that every morning to get started. And I do similar kind of things because uh, you, you realize like the natural easiest thing to do is run yourself down, but it doesn't help you. <laughs> it doesn't serve you. Um, it does to a certain point, like you, in when you're young and you get da 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 whatever. But at some point in your life, you reach a place where it no longer serves you, and you have to do something else. Um, and so if so, if you're talking about, you know, as relating to moral injury, this person is in crisis and, and we have to try to help them, you know, com- do, maybe do a lot of things differently. But it's a small thing, as you mentioned, of just finding those things. You, those things can be it's often the small things like that that can make a huge, huge difference uh, in people's lives in recovery, you know, and, and it is something they have to find in themselves. It really is true. When you're talking about psychological stuff, you know, nobody can wave a magic wand and fix you. I can only just give you ideas, but you have to like take those on and use them. There's no other way Mm -hmm. uh, unless you just medicate yourself into oblivion. But, you know, there's really no other way than a, person has to own some it's their own mind that they have to change and we can help them do it and those little things they seem small and you might think well what's that going to do but then you start doing it you go wow that's a huge difference so if you were to give our listeners and somebody some key takeaways from today dan some things that you would like everybody to know or remember about moral injury, what would those be? Well, I would say that um, moral injury is something that can happen to anyone and it can happen in any industry. And it's not just a veteran phenomenon. It's a human phenomenon. And we all can experience it in, in just many different ways. But the second thing is, no matter how traumatic the experience is, um, there is a way to to move forward with it. Um, It's not about forgetting it. It's not about, you know, whatever. But no matter how you feel right now, there is a way to feel better. There is a way to... um, to forgive yourself or forgive others or, you know, be happy again. What that way is for you is not necessarily, I mean, there there are people that have done, you know, all the VA stuff. Like this one guy did all the different modalities the VA had to offer and nothing seemed to help. And a friend talked him into going to a retreat and it's Who's for Veterans was a retreat he went to. Uh, he was ready to commit suicide because he tried everything. He thought he, and nothing was working. Um, but as a favor to a friend, he decided to go to this retreat and it saved his life. It totally changed his life. So 
So I don't know what that is for you. I've talked to a lot of people and there's a lot of different modalities, but there's a way, you know, for you to, to recover if, if that's the word. Um, and then the final thing is, is let's keep talking about it. Let's, let's keep researching it. You know, let's not rush a, as a, as a field, as a set of professions, whether it's psychologist, social worker, whatever. Let's not rush to, hey, let's define it, get it in the DSM-5, start getting money from it. Let's not do that. Let's let's take our time. Let's keep talking about it. Let's keep working through it. And um, from my perspective, from a chaplaincy perspective, I don't need precise definitions. I just need to know somebody's hurting and I want to be able to help them. But let's, you know, let's just keep the conversations going, not rush to judgment. And every little beat, every conversation we have about this, it, it educates more, it teaches people more, it it, it offers another way uh, towards healing for people and as a society. So I think those are some key things I, I would mm-hmm. want people to remember. If people want to get hold of you, Tom, where can I find you? Yeah, so you can find us at missions.org, M-I-S-N-S dot org. And then um, at, on that website, you can find our phone number, 910 uh, 910-701-0306. We'll put the show notes down as well. Uh-huh. Okay. And just to yeah. remind that is a USA-based number. Yes, yes. sorry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, or, or you can email droberts at chaplainconsultants.com. Uh, but the main place, if you go to missions.org, uh, you can find all the different ways to get in touch with us. Uh, we do have a conference coming up in September um, that would, if you want to learn more about moral injury or or you have some expertise about moral injury that you want to present to us, next September is our annual confer- comprehensive moral injury conference. That's on our website. We do offer training for organizations um, about moral injury. And uh, so, so there's a lot of different services we offer that can, that can help. And uh, I, I really appreciate you having me on this podcast. It's always great talking to both of you. Mm-hmm. It's we always really a pleasure. Coming on, Dan. Mm-hmm. I think we're um, we're currently we're currently we've got the the, the com- next next year's moral injury conference in the diary. We're like, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 let's go see Dan. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. It's a pleasure yeah. as always, Dan. And thank yeah, you so thank much you for the gift much. of your time. Great. Thank you. Till next time. Till next time. Till next time.